Because some people argue, it's, ah, it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. If I look at someone, if I look at something on a screen, it's not, I'm not hurting them. And, well, true, you're not hurting them. But it's not the way God designed that body to be used. And God designed you to be passionately in love and wild and crazy about one other person's body. And if you do God's design, that's the best way to live. Lust is basically any time you desire something that isn't yours. You could lust after a car. Your friend has a car. You could lust after the car. I want that car. Look at the car's curves. Oh my gosh. Right? <laughs> what is under the hood? Yeah, you can. <laughs> you can lust after anything. And obviously you could lust after someone's body. However, until you're married, that person's body isn't yours. Let me be very frank. If you're dating someone, and you're dating exclusively, if you're not married to them, that body isn't yours. It's not yours yet. If you get married, great. Then it's blessed by God. And it's wonderful. And it's meant, you're meant to be enjoyed by each other. It's meant to be this beautiful, God-blessed thing. But until you're married, that body isn't yours. That means you're not supposed to touch it, enjoy it, stare at it, think about it, do all those things. It's not yours yet. Again, can you do all those things? Yep. Is it going to produce harm? Yep. Because you're going against the way God designed it to work. We've been reading Proverbs on the weekends. Proverbs 6, 25 came across. It's awesome. It says, do not lust in your heart after her. And use the example of a guy and a girl, okay? But it works backwards too. Do not lust after her in your heart, her beauty, or let her captivate you with your eyes. This is very wise. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. It says, hey, don't lust after what is not yours. Don't be captivated by that. It's not yours. It's not the way God designed it to work. You are desiring, whenever you lust after someone else, you're, you're designed someone who's not yours. To lust after someone who isn't your spouse is a deviation from God's plan. To lust after any person that is not in God's plan for you is a deviation from God's plan for you. That was wordy. Can I read it again? To lust after a person that is not God's plan for you is a deviation from God's plan for you. God has a plan for your life. And any time you step out of that, Harm comes. I fully believe that. So, repeat after me. Sex is for married people. Sex is for married people. That's the way God designed it. That's the way God designed it. Amen. Amen. No, you're good. Thank you. Stop. <laughs> Third grade all over again right there. Okay. Well, let's talk about this real quick. What kind of sex is for married people? Any kind of sex, right? I bring, hey, hey, you laugh. I bring this up because I've had the question asked. How far is too far? Don't raise your hand, but you thought of it. Am I right? Wink at me or something. Like, yeah, don't wink at me. <laughs> How far is too far? Remember, sex is for married people, any kind, because it's God's plan. Listen, God isn't being mean to you. He didn't create you with all these hormones, and he's not unfair. He... It's simply not part of his design. Let me say it this way, okay? Let me give you an illustration. Have you ever seen sumo wrestlers? It's totally gross. <laughs> big ring, these huge dudes, I mean, massive dudes, and they're, they have a lot of fat on them, but they're incredibly strong too, they're athletes, I mean, it's amazing. Okay, if, if you got in the ring with a sumo wrestler, there's no way you could win, because you're overmatched. That guy is bigger than you, and I realize we have some football players and athletes in the room. You versus 400 pounds is not going to work, okay? Like, it just doesn't work. You're going to lose because he is sumo size. But the illustration, listen, listen. The illustration is this. What would happen if over the course of months you were able to shrink the sumo by maybe starving him? If he's your enemy and he's your opponent, you can starve him and you could get him down to where he's actually probably a manageable size. Then you step in the ring, you have a chance to actually defeat him. And especially if you starve him, he's in kind of a weakened state. He still exists, but he's weak. You could probably easily defeat him. 
on week one, I said, God created you with these desires. And we talked about it at the beginning of the message tonight. He created you with a desire for the opposite side. He created you to notice when somebody walks by. Look at an airport sometime, it's hilarious. Somebody walks by and they're like, like, you were created with this thing inside of you that notices other people, good looking people, guys and girls alike. That part, okay, that, that is your desire. But the problem is, whenever we feed this desire, it becomes, here it is, sumo side. And whenever it comes to the battle of self-control, if you have this huge fed desire that is not the way God created it, you're going to lose. It's like stepping in the ring with a huge sumo wrestler. But if you could learn to limit the food that you feed your thought life, if you could limit the music that talks about sexual things, if you could limit the, the movies or the images or fast forward commercials or whatever you got to do, if you could limit that, well then it's not necessarily suicide. It's manageable. Does that make sense? I could repeat it. Does it make sense? God created you with a desire for the opposite sex. He did not create you with a lust desire for the opposite sex. There's a difference. And so you have to own your life and monitor what comes into you. We all know this to be true. If you listen to a song, what happens in your brain? The song gets stuck in your head and you sing it all day, right? Okay, well what happens if you listen to a song that talks about another person's body and doing things with them? Have you ever heard a song like that? There's a couple out there, right? One or two. Yeah. Okay, well, if, that, if you listen to that and it gets stuck in your head, what are you thinking about all day? She's so fine, she blow my mind, you're crazy. Right? Like, yeah, you're, you're thinking about that. Up all night to get lucky? What? Like, if you watch a movie, I'm not even going to go there. You're mature enough to handle it. Right? If you feed yourself that, then that is what you're going to think about. I'll move on. Let me read 1 Corinthians 6 to you. Chapter 6, verse 16. Again, this is tagging on to these principles we've been talking about. Let me read it and I'll explain it. Don't you realize that if a man joins himself, and Paul gives the example of a prostitute, if a man joins himself to a prostitute, remember, joint, sexual intercourse, he becomes one body with her. For the scriptures say the two are united as one. And that's quoting Jesus, which is quoting the beginning in Genesis. The two are united as one. Here's what you got to understand. Any type of sexual interaction that you have with another person, it's actually a spiritual thing. Because you're doing something that God designed to bond a marriage together. And if you don't do that under the covenant of marriage, it causes damage. I used to give this illustration. I don't think we have a piece of paper on here. But, like, does anybody have a piece of paper? No book? Anyone? Boom. Can you just tear out a page? Thank you. Bunyo. So if you look at this edge of the paper up here, not the one she tore, but look at this edge. It's machined. It's good. It's clean, right? Everybody see this? Not your question. Okay. If you... So, if two people get married, they're joined together, it is like this. This page was meant to go together. A man and a woman under the confident, uh, covenant of marriage was meant to be going together. It's beautiful. Whenever you join and then you separate because you're not married, so if you just have sex with someone, in Paul's case, if you have sex with a prostitute, you're torn. 